tonight on Y News. Malacanang accepts the resignation of National Irrigation Administration or NIA Administrator Peter Lavinia. The Senate of the Philippines is set to decide on the concurrence to the Paris Climate Change Pact following their ratification by President Rodrigo Duterte. The House plenary approves the death penalty reimposition bill on its second reading. The Bureau of Fire Protection pushes for the implementation of the one-lane policy for fire trucks as the fire prevention month begins. Scientists believe a new laser technique will give insight about the history of small feathered dinosaurs taking flight as birds. And to know why there are no chairs at a stand-up steakhouse in New York City. Why News begins now. From the UNTV News and Rescue Command Center, this is Why News. Angelo Castro III and Darlene Basingan. Good evening. Malacanang has accepted the resignation of National Irrigation Administration Chief Peter Lavinia after serving the agency for almost three months. Ray Pelay will tell us why. NIA Administrator Peter Lavinia has tendered his resignation amidst attempts to vilify, discredit, and malign him and to spare the president from any embarrassment due to these attempts. It is with deep regret that our office receives this news and wishes him well in his next endeavors. The Malacanang confirmed today the resignation of National Irrigation Administration Chief Peter Lavinia. This following an alleged corruption controversy, but a NIA official says health reason is a possibility for Lavinia's resignation or the stricter implementation of the administrator, especially on contractors. During his time, may mga contractors kami na sinulatan na, na they were given warning na uh, to, to fast track their project or their contract be terminated. During Lavinia's guesting on UNTV's program, Get It Straight with Daniel Razon, on January 11, 2017, he said that his first mandate was to check the contractors for NIA's project. Mukhang may monopoly daw yata ng mga kontraktista dyan sa, sa NIA. Nasilip niyo na ho ba yan? Well, nakita ko nga, napansin ko na parang ilang mga big contractors lang mm -hmm. uh, ang nakakasali no? mm -hmm. at nananalo sa mga project sa NIA. Yes. Uh, Napag-alaman ko, talagang very limited ang nagsumasali. Mm -hmm. Kaya nga policy natin ngayon talaga open bidding. He also said that there are those who used his name to collect money. Huwag ho kayong maniniwala sa mga nung kwento. Uh, Paano natin may bibigay kung hindi sila sumali mm -hmm. in the first place? Mm -hmm. di ba? Pero marami dyan, gumagamit ng ating pangalan. Yes. Ginagamit ang pangalan ng Nia. Mm -hmm. Nagpa-promise na meron daw uh, sure na sure na kontrata mabibigay sa kanino, ganito ko ganyan. Uh, Lavinia worked with President Rodrigo Duterte even when the president was still the mayor of Davao City. Lavinia also became the campaign spokesperson and head of the Duterte's transition team until he was appointed as the presidential special assistant. And in November 2016, he was appointed as the head of the National Irrigation Administration or NIA. Prior to the palace's confirmation, Lavinia already posted on his social media account that he was resigning from his post and denied allegations of corruption. He also thanked the president for the opportunity given him and asserted that he never betrayed Duterte. For now, NIA Deputy Administrator Estrella Icasiano will be NIA's officer in charge. There are also rumors that the former AFP Chief of Staff Ricardo Visaya will be the next NIA Administrator. Ray Pilayo, UNTV News and Rescue, Quezon City. The Senate will hold hearings before concurring to the Paris Climate Change Agreement duly ratified by President Rodrigo Duterte yesterday. Joyce Balancho will tell us why. 
Change Committee Chairperson Senator Lauren Legarda has received today a copy of the Paris Climate Change Agreement after it has been ratified by President Rodrigo Duterte. In the Paris Agreement, the Philippines is agreeing to lower to 1.5 degrees Celsius the global warming limit as to prevent adverse effects of climate change. Legarda says it's time that the country joins the other nations in implementing policies that aim to limit the greenhouse gas emissions. Once the ratification process is completed, the country will be given access to Green Climate Fund amounting to 100 billion US dollars starting 2020. This will be used to aid countries that are affected by climate change. It comes at a very crucial time in the history of our nation and of the world when we are threatened by one of the most difficult humanitarian challenges of our time and that is the issue of climate change turbocharged by the impacts of natural hazards which is not only continuing but becoming more intense. The copy of the Paris Agreement will be forwarded to the office of the Senate President and eventually be referred to the Foreign Affairs Committee headed by Senator Alan Peter Cayetano. The said committee will conduct hearings and will come up with a committee report to be sponsored on the plenary floor, after which the senators will vote whether or not to concur with the agreement. Two-thirds or equivalent to 16 votes from senators are needed. Legarda hopes that her colleagues will support the measure in order to complete its ratification process before session adjourns on March 18. I am optimistic and confident because it was bipartisan, perhaps even multipartisan. There were calls for the president from last year to ratify it, whether it's from the Liberal Party, administration senators. There was really... Uh, a call for ratification and so we hope that this kind of support continues. Meanwhile, the Climate Change Commission or CCC lauds President Rodrigo Duterte for ratifying the Paris Climate Pact, saying he has been true to his word in his first State of the Nation address that he will prioritize climate change. Aside from the Philippines, the United States and China, who are considered to be biggest emitters of greenhouse gases, have also ratified the Paris Agreement. Joyce Balancho, UNCB News and Rescue, Senate of the Philippines. The Department of Science and Technology will ramp up its research on renew renewable energy and conservation. Rosalie Cos will tell us why. The Department of Science and Technology, or DOST, admits it will not be easy to accomplish the Philippines' commitment to the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, especially the reduction of greenhouse or carbon emissions, to 70% by year 2030. DOST Secretary Fortunato de la Peña says after President Rodrigo Duterte signed the Paris Climate Pact, the department's programs must focus on how to meet the country's commitment. He says one way is to ramp up the DOST's research on renewable energies and energy conservation. So we have to intensify our research uh, on renewable energies, on uh, uh, energy conservation, and on other areas uh, where we think uh, uh, this is really more on uh, energy use, on energy energy conservation, and uh, of course uh, in terms of protecting the environment. DOST also has to study various options it can recommend to small-scale industries in terms of what equipment or system to use in their production. Now we are opening the, uh, the uh, system to companies who want to improve to change, let's say, from from uh, traditional energy source to renewable so we can help them acquire the needed equipment. The official is confident that the Philippines can perform well in its commitment to the Climate Pact, which is agreed upon by over 190 parties in the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change in December 2015. But the public must ensure its cooperation to be able to do this. Whatever difficulties we may encounter, we are bound to uh, extend our support to that. So um, I think uh, uh, it, it is doable if uh, all sectors will cooperate. Rosa Licoz, UNTV News and Rescue, Malacanang.
The executive order on the two-year moratorium on land conversion will be out soon, according to the Department of Agrarian Reform. Aga Kakbay will tell us why. Agrarian Reform Secretary Rafael Mariano confirms that President Rodrigo Duterte wants to fast-track the processing of agrarian reform for the benefit of local farmers. Mariano says the President wants to ensure food security in the country and to provide programs to improve the production and the lives of farmers in the country. In fact, Mariano says the President has had a meeting with the Presidential Agrarian Reform Council twice regarding the matter. Yun nga pong nakatakdang susunod na pulong ng Presidente sa Agrarian Reform Council sa April 28 eh, ang sabi po ng Presidente na nagsilbing uh, direktiba na niya ay paagahin natin yan. Thus, Malacanang assures that the two-year moratorium on conversion of farmland into subdivisions and industrial parks will soon be out. According to Presidential Spokesperson Yusek Ernesto Abelia, the draft executive order is currently being studied by Executive Secretary Salvador Medialdea. Based on data from the Department of Agrarian Reform, or DAR, there is a total of 28,072 hectares of land with corresponding beneficiaries recorded from January to December 2016. DAR has already distributed a total of 15,711 hectares to farmers under the Duterte administration. Aga Kaakba, UNTV News and Rescue, Quezon City. Supporters of Environment Secretary Gina Lopez, composed of anti-mining groups, marched to the Senate today. Joyce Balancho will tell us why. Today is the supposed hearing of the Commission on Appointments for the Confirmation of Gina Lopez as the Secretary of the Department of Environment and Natural Resources, or DENR. More than 3,000 members of anti-mining groups marched to the Senate today to call for her immediate confirmation. The groups who joined the protest include Sangdakas, Greenpeace, Alianza Tigel Mina, Save Sierra Madre, as well as farmers and fishermen from Batangas and Mindoro. However, Greenpeace says they have not been informed that the confirmation hearing of Lopez was postponed today following the reorganization in the Senate. We would like to push for the confirmation of Secretary Gina Lopez. Despite the, despite the postponement of the meeting of the CA, yung position ng different organizations, hindi lang environmental organizations, but a people's organizations, farmers, fisher folks, will stay. It will never change. The leaders of the group also plan to submit position papers to the office of Senator Manny Pacquiao, who chairs the Senate Environment Committee of the CA. Secretary Lopez arrived at the rally shortly and expressed her appreciation of her supporters. We will work together. Okay, magsama-sama tayong lahat para makamit isang pansa na lahat ay nagmamahalan at wala nang mahirap sana. Yung laban, hindi tukol sa akin. Para ito sa kalikasan, sa ating kinabukasan, at ito ang sobrang confidence ko na kung alagaan ng kalikasan, na may pakinabang ang lahat, doon manggagaling ang kinabukasan ng bansa. Meanwhile, Senator Lauren Legarda, who is the member of the Committee on Environment and Natural Resources of CA, openly expressed support for the advocacies of the DENR Secretary. We're trying to convince the others to help support her. Of course, that's another matter in the Commission of Appointments. And I hope that she, should, she would continue uh, what she's doing, uh, even beyond the issue of mining. Meanwhile, pro-mining protesters trooped to the DNR office in Quezon City to oppose Lopez confirmation. They're asking to allow mining in their area as their livelihood has been affected already. Lopez has earlier assured that affected families will be given livelihood through development of ecotourism sites. Senator Manny Pacquiao, who heads the Committee on Environment and Natural Resources of the CA, confirms receiving various complaints from mining companies and workers, opposing the confirmation of Secretary Lopez. While he himself supports Lopez, the committee will still have to hear out their side. Magkita nga ulo ko dahil sa dami ng mga uh, oppositors na uh, naka, naka abang na. And then, uh, siyempre, as a chairman, uh, papakinggan din natin yung panig nila. And then, uh, yung mga ibang mga members, hindi natin mapipigil sila kung ayaw nila. 
Pacquiao says Lopez confirmation will be scheduled once the competition of the CA committee is finalized. Joyce Balancho, UNTV News and Rescue, Senate of the Philippines. The House Minority Bloc will insist the amendments on some provisions of the death penalty reimposition bill, which will limit the period of its implementation to June 2022. Nel Maribuhok will tell us why. The crimes of plunder, treason, and rape were finally removed from the provisions of the death penalty reimposition bill. This was after the House Majority Bloc presented their amendments to the bill. In the substitute bill, death penalty imposition will be limited only to drug-related offenses. These include the importation, trade, and manufacturing illegal drugs. Also planting evidences of illegal drugs. The illegal possession of illegal drugs has not been included in the list. In one of the provisions of the bill, the court judge has the discretion of choosing what mode of death penalty will be imposed if by hanging, firing squad, or lethal injection. In connection with this, the minority bloc apparently accepted the controversial bill may be passed in the lower house, but they will insist their proposed amendments like sunset provision, wherein the effectivity of the reimposition of death penalty is up to June 2022 or only within the term of President Rodrigo Duterte. At dahil wala kami numero, at least limitahan natin yung panahon kung kailan po pwede magpataw ng death penalty. I will be a member of the BICAM. I will insist on the sunset provision. It is expected that before the session break on March 18, the lower house will approve the bill in the third and final readings. Nel Maribuho, UNTV News and Rescue, House of Representatives. The House plenary approves the death penalty reimposition bill on second reading. From the House of Representatives, Nel Maribuho is back to tell us why live. Yes, Nell, go ahead. Darlene, at 7.31, the House Deputy Majority Floor Leader Juan Pablo Bondoc submits motion to terminate the period of amendments. By Viva Voce, the period of amendments terminated and immediately the House Bill 4727 or Death Penalty Reimposition Bill approved in the second reading. Mr. Speaker, I move for approval on second Mr. reading Speaker. of House Bill 4727. So moved, Mr. Speaker. There is a motion to approve House Bill 4727 for second reading. Those who are in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those who are against, please say nay. Nay. The ayes have it. Mr. Speaker. The House Bill 4727 is approved on second Mr. reading. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. This after Congressman Lagman questioned the members present in the House required for a quorum. The House Majority Leader Rudy Farina stood up and favored another roll call and moved to terminate the period of amendments. 227 members were present on the second roll call. Therefore, a quorum was declared. Earlier, some lawmakers, namely Congressman Rolando Andaya, Tom Villarin, Raul Daza, Rodante Marcoleta, Ramon Rocamora, and Edsel Lagman presented their individual amendments. Congressman Lagman has proposed to remove the term death in the bill. All of the proposed amendments rejected by one of the sponsors of the bill, House Committee on Justice Representative Reynaldo Umali, saying that they would no longer accept any amendment, citing omnibus rejection. Again by Viva Voce or voice of voting, the lawmakers who presented amendments lost the appeal. Congressman Umali explained that inserting or deleting the original provisions of the House Bill 4727 will lose its intention of just reimposing the death penalty. Darlene? Thank you, Nell. And that's Nell Maribuho reporting live from the House of Representatives. The Philippine Army is set to recruit around 14,000 new soldiers this year. Brian DePaz will tell us why. 
The Philippine Army will be hiring more than 13,000 new soldiers this year. The additional manpower will be mobilized to go after terrorist groups like Abu Sayyaf and New People's Army and to fill in vacant positions in the infantry, artillery units, engineer, communication, logistics, and administrative functions of the Philippine Army. Army Commanding General Glorioso Miranda says it would relieve soldiers from many duties. Just a fill up as I said. No, it will just make our job easier in the meantime. Kasi it's economy of scale. Kung limang sundalo yung lumalaban, na dapat sampu sila. Siyempre, di times to yung effort nila. Meanwhile, the Philippine Army assures that candidate soldiers will receive a gross income of 16,852 pesos, while those enlisted as new private soldiers will receive a gross income of 23,204 pesos. The amount is aside from allowances and benefits they will get. Lalong lalo na rito, pinaprioritize ko yung uh, benepisyo o welfare na ating kasundaluhan. Yung mga force protection, dito, helmet to increase their survivability. The Philippine Army also prioritizes the recruitment of military science graduates, those with advanced ROTC course, college graduates, those who were able to finish 72 units in college, high school graduate with technical and vocational skills which is needed in the Philippine Army. The applicants may go to the Army Recruitment Centers in Fort Bonifacio, Metro Manila, Camp Lapu-Lapu, Cebu City, and Camp Evangelista in Cagayan de Oro. They should bring identification cards, NBI clearance, and other required documents. For other information regarding recruitment, applicants may visit the Philippine Army website www.army.mil.ph. Brian De Paz, UNTV News and Rescue, Taguig City. The Armed Forces of the Philippines confirms 25 foreigners and 6 Filipinos remain hostage by the terrorist group Abu Sayyaf. Joanna will tell us why. Despite the relentless military operations to capture the bandit groups in the southern portion of the country, AFP admits that it is still very difficult for them to repress the terrorist Abu Sayyaf group because of the culture in the communities where these groups are hiding. Recently, the group has beheaded German national Jürgen Kantner. As of today, there are still 25 foreigners and 6 Filipinos still held captive by ASG. Based on information gathered by the Armed Forces of the Philippines or AFP, these hostages include 12 Vietnamese nationals, 7 Indonesians, 5 Malaysians, 1 Dutch national, and 6 Filipinos. AFP explains that it is not under their jurisdiction to control a certain community unless the president declares martial law in a specific area or put it under the state of emergency. It's hard to find because they're all the same. The bawat barrio na may isang bahay dyan na hindi mo sa silong nila may isang nakatago so it's not easy because it has been a culture parang cottage industry na na sinusupport at kaya magkakamag-anak yan eh in line with this, the AFP has launched the Integrated Area Development Plan that aims to strengthen and develop the ties of the military with the local government units in some portions of the Mindanao region. He is trying to have the whole government agencies team up to address the systemic needs or systemic problems of the place. Hindi po malulutas ng batas ng uh, military solution lamang ang mga problema po dito sa lugar na ito. Malalim na ang ugat ng pinagmumula ng mga problema ito. Sa lalim nito, ang tingin ng tao sa kidnap for ransom ay isang cottage industry na, isang kabuhayan. Meanwhile, the AFP has created a task force to search for the remains of the German national beheaded by the Abu Sayyaf group. Joan Nano, UNCV News and Rescue, Manila. The Eastern Mindanao Command of the Armed Forces of the Philippines challenges the New People's Army to show sign of sincerity that they really want to talk peace with local government units like Davao City. Victor Cosari will tell us why. 
There is a welcome development for the Eastern Mindanao Command or East Mincom of the Armed Forces of the Philippines that the New People's Army heeded to the call of Davao City Mayor Sara Duterte Carpio to talk peace. Just last week, Mayor Duterte stated that she wants to listen to the plight of the rebel group. However, she clarified that what she could offer is limited only within her authority and jurisdiction, which is Davao City. The local chief executive made the pronouncement following a series of attacks by the NPA in the 3rd District of the city where two soldiers were among the casualties. In response, the NPA said they are willing to sit down and talk to the local government of Davao City. The East Mincom says they will support the conduct of localized peace talks in the city. Kasi ngayon na, tuloy -tuloy yung all out uh, operations natin against the uh, NPAs and uh, we could ease up the pressure if only to give way to this uh, peace offer ng ating uh, mahal mayor. The specifics of the said talks have not yet been released. However, the military insists that the rebel group must show signs of sincerity in talking peace with the government. Some confidence building measures on their part. Uh, if they are true to their word, uh, they will stop uh, their violent uh, actions and atrocities against communities. If they would stop extortion, if they would stop harassing uh, the rural communities, Latin, and even their troops and security personnel. On the other hand, the 10th Infantry Division of the Philippine Army says that since February 1, when the NPA declared it will lift its own unilateral ceasefire against the government, one NPA member has been arrested, three were killed in encounters, eight were captured, and 42 have surrendered to authorities in Region 11 and Region 12. Meron pong pangamahayag galing din mismo sa mga NPA na nagsurrender sa amin kasi sila po yung nakakalam eh na meron, talagang meron ng mga gambling sa loob. So meron ng mga gustong lumabas. Siguro humahanap lang ng pagkakataon. Victor Cosare, UNTV News and Rescue, Davao City. President Rodrigo Duterte wants to meet with jeepney strikers on jeepney phase-out and modernization. Presidential spokesperson Undersecretary Ernesto Abella said the president made a statement during his meeting with the labor group leaders at Malacanang on Monday night. However, the palace has no details yet on when the meeting will be held. The president also assured the workers group that he would be holding a separate meeting with the jeepney strikers who, hold in, who held the national strike on the controversial plan to face out old jeepneys. He, it was an assurance that he would also uh, listen to them because their own, uh, their own concerns were different. Palacanang suspended elementary and high school classes in Metro Manila and other areas affected by transport strike organized against a jeepney face out and a modernization program of the government. Next on Y News. NCRPO chief confirms that the suspect in the recent road rage in Quezon City sent his surrender feelers. And the Commission on Elections targets register at least 21 million youth for satellite registrations in schools. Y News will be right back. News would like to thank the following Engine Industries, Grand Eagle Cookware, Darwin D. Trading Medical Supplies, 7M Construction and Development Corporation, Energy Tech Engineering Services and Trading, Elpan Consultancy Services Corporation, Summit One Business Solutions Incorporated, 347 School and Office Supplies Incorporated. Quezon City Police District says the suspect in a recent fatal road rage incident is about to surrender. Grace Cassin will tell us why. 
Quezon City Police District or QCPD Director Police Chief Superintendent Guillermo Alizar says road rage suspect Fredison Atienza who allegedly shot Anthony Mendoza last Saturday on D. Tuazon Street corner Quezon Avenue might surrender any time. According to Eliazar, the suspect's lawyer has already talked to them to ask what to prepare before the suspect surrenders. However, the lawyer did not state when the suspect Atienza would surrender to authorities. Meron pumunta doon na lawyer niya, requested by the family na makapag-usap sa amin to explore kung ano mga dapat gawin. The QCPD recovered the white Toyota Land Cruiser used by the suspect with plate number AHA-3458. Authorities also found out in their investigation that licenses for the caliber 45 pistol and Glock 9mm pistol registered to the suspects have already expired. The QCPD has manhunt operations underway. He is considered now as armed and dangerous. The QCPD also assures that once suspect and the victim's camp settle, criminal charges will still be pressed against the suspect. Grace Cassid, UNTV News and Rescue, Camp Krame. The Armed Forces of the Philippines and the Philippine Drug Enforcement Agency intensify its cooperation against illegal drug syndicates. John Anna will tell us why. The Philippine Drug Enforcement Agency, or PDEA, and the Armed Forces of the Philippines, or AFP, vows to focus on stopping the operation of big syndicates behind the trading of illegal drugs in the country. The assurance came following the signing yesterday of PDEA and AFP of an agreement that strengthens their cooperation in intensifying the anti-illegal drugs campaign of the government. We uh, assure the public that we will not go to the street level kind that has been uh, linked to Tokhang. Hindi po yan. Ang tinatarget po natin sa pagiging par pagkakaroon ng partnership na ito ay yung malik malakihang sindikato. The AFP says PIDEA will still lead the operation while the armed forces will help in gathering intelligence report, deploying additional personnel and equipment every time there is an operation. So support ang aming role sa PIDEA in terms of information, gathering, information sharing, and provision of forces in areas that they will require forces and equipment to carry out an operation. Aside from the NCR, the program also covers the soldiers assigned in various regional offices. Just yesterday, President Rodrigo Duterte decided to revive the Oplan Tokang of the PNP. The president, however, said cops who will be part of the operation will be thoroughly selected. This is to ensure that those who will be chosen deserve to join the operation and to avoid repeat of the kidnapping and killing of Korea. National G. Ju. Joan Nano, UN TV News and Rescue, Kesson City. PNP Chief Police Director General Ronald De La Rosa confirms a failed assassination plot against him by the Maute Group. De La Rosa says he will not be cowed by the said terror group. Grace Cassian will tell us why. PNP Chief Police Director General Ronald De La Rosa believes that the Maute terror group wants him dead because of his job. This Maute group is uh, being fed with uh, drug money, di ba? Uh, the sa drug money, then uh, maybe, nasaktan sila sa ating uh, uh, drug war. So, yeah, that's my own uh, opinion only. This after a PNP chief discovered an assassination plot against him following the arrest of a suspected member of the Maute group identified as a Yemen Alonte. Yung ano, eh, nagagaling sa bibig mismo nung uh, isang uh, suspect na involved doon sa karnaping ng sasakyan na nabuhay, na hindi napatay. At yan yung kanilang in-interrogate. The foiled assassination happened on January 25 in Marawi City when he was the guest speaker at an event in his alma mater, the Mindanao State University. De La Rosa claims the group planned to shoot him down or bomb his car. Merong isa sa kanila babaril sa akin. Uh, yung, yung operasyon na yun ay supervised by one of the Maute brothers na nandun talaga sa binyo, doon sa binyo ng aking pinuntahan. Base doon sa assessment na yun ng uh, nakarecover ng mga bomba doon sa loob ng campus. 
na meron din. Di ba, may the following day, may na-recover sila na IED doon sa loob mismo ng uh, Emisio Campos. De La Rosa is thankful that the assassination plot failed and further stresses that the incident will not stop him from fighting illegal drugs and terrorists. I'm not afraid to die. Anytime. I can die anytime. Mas nagtatrabaho lang ako. They cannot deter me from uh, doing my job. Alam ko hindi ko papabayaan ni Lord. The God is always with me wherever I go. Grace Kasin, UNTV News and Rescue, Camp Krame. The Bureau of Fire Protection or BFP launched today the Fire Prevention Month. The BFP is also pushing for the implementation of the one-lane policy for fire trucks for faster response. Monoxon will tell us why. Fire incidents this year have increased compared with 2015 and 2016. From January to February, the Bureau of Fire Protection has already recorded 260 fire incidents. Based on BFP's data, most fires usually occur in residential areas and informal settlements. In 2015, the BFP recorded 1,456 incidents of fire in residential areas and informal settlements. BFP explains that fire occurs frequently in depressed areas, where roads are narrow and houses are built close together and made of light materials. Faulty electrical wiring is the main cause of fire in the country, followed by irresponsible disposal of cigarette butts, unattended lit candles, and leaking gas ranges. One problem encountered by firemen is the difficulty in getting through heavy traffic and narrow roads. This is the reason why the BFP is pushing for the one-lane policy on roads to allow firefighters to respond faster when there is fire. Kasi padali yung ating tinatawag na firefighting operation, pag-iisang linya lang yung ating ginagamit dahil pag nagdobli-dobli na yan, eh, magulo na sa ating operation. At saka, hindi makakapasok at makakalabas yung mga firefighting units na dapat kumuha ng tubig para makakispond yun. The BFP will file charges against motorists who will intentionally block the path of fire trucks. Pag iniwan dyan, eh, blocking yan, mga designated fire lanes. Mayroon meron dyan, obstruction, blocking of designated fire lanes. Pwede natin yan, ano, kabulin. BFP reminds the public to avoid multiple connections, don't leave candles unattended, and always clean gas ranges. Meanwhile, UNTV News and Rescue took part of the activities prepared by BFP. UNTV News and Rescue is one of the leading partners of the Bureau of Fire Protection in responding to fire incidents. Mon Hoxon, UNTV News and Rescue, Quezon City. The Commission on Elections or COMELEC targets 21 million youth voters to register in satellite registrations in universities for the Barangay and Sangguniang Kabataan elections in October. Ayoko Miguel will tell us why. The COMELEC is currently campaigning to youths aged 15 to 30 years old to register and exercise their rights of suffrage. Thus, the poll body has begun to install satellite registration booths in universities. Based on COMELEC data, the youth constitutes almost half of the electorate. From 18 to 30 years old, I, they comprise 40 to 45 percent of the electorate. That is about, translates to about 21 million votes. This morning, COMELEC, in partnership with the National Youth Commission, has opened a satellite registration booth at the Pamantasan ng Lungsod ng Maynila. Voters' registration has been made easy and brought closer their area. If I remember correctly, when I registered last 2010, um, napaka-haba ng pila. So wala yung gantong mga satellite registration na ginagawa ng COMELEC. It's good now that the government is taking this initiative para ilapit dun sa mga botante at mapadali yung proseso ng pagrerehistro. Some students and professors of PLM were given a chance to ask questions to COMELEC Chairman Andres Bautista and the representative of the NYC. Magre-register po ba ulit kami since kahit nakaboto na po kami sa national election? So, ano po po yung other qualities na dapat meron yung list? Yung po bang anti-dynasty law ay ipapatupad po ngayong 2017 SK election knowing that uh, no, uh, there are other uh, youth na hindi aware na merong ganitong batas. Bautista also gave an advice on how to choose an honest and good leader. Titignan nyo, unang-una yung plataforma. 
ano ba yung kanyang mga iniisip na gawin kung siya ay mahahalal. At isipin nyo kung yung mga gusto niyang gawin ay sumasang-ayon sa inyong kagustuhan. Pangalawa, track record. Comelec is set to open satellite registration booths in various universities and colleges across the country to ensure that more youth will be able to register before the deadline on April 29, 2017 so they could vote in the upcoming Barangay and SK polls on October 23, 2017. Aiko Miguel, UNTV News and Rescue, Manila. The management of the MRT Line 3 announces the possible use of Dalian trains starting this month. Monoxon will tell us why. Commuters can finally use some of the new coaches of the MRT starting this March. The final testing of the new MRT Dalian trains is about to be completed. Afterwards, it can be used by the public. MRT General Manager Deo Leo Manalo says the trains will be immediately released for public use after the issuance of a safety certificate. Nasaan namin na uh, within the month of March, mapagana na natin dahil malaki po ang kakulangan ng MRT3 sa number of trains operating. So sana as soon as possible, mapatakbo na natin. MRT signaling system has now been updated and are now compatible with the new trains from China. The signaling system serves as a protection of trains to avoid train collusion. The signaling system serves as the protection of trains to avoid train collision. MRT is currently undergoing an upgrade in its power supply from 750 kilovolts to 1,500 kilovolts. The current power supply of MRT can't run more trains. It is being upgraded as preparation for the new additional trains. MRT, however, says the entire 48 new trains can't be released yet pending the train's compliance to the 5,000-kilometer requirement. The management of the MRT hopes to run all new additional trains this year. Meanwhile, GM Manalo denies allegations of Senator Nancy Binay that the Dalian trains are damaged and have cracks. Ang Dalian train po ay hindi pa pinapatakbo ng revenue operation. So, wala kaming alam na merong crack. Ibig sabihin, yung mga lumang train, yung check trains, yung mga dating train ng MRT, meron po sila ng mga naging problema. Pero ngayon po, naayos na rin naman na yun. The installation of additional trains at the MRT would help shorten the daily long queues of passenger. Moin Hoxon, UNTV News and Rescue, Quezon City. TV and members of Church of God International once again held a free medical mission activity in the town of Rizal in Laguna. Leslie Longbowen will tell us why. For the second time, UNTV granted the request of the mayor of Rizal, Laguna, which is to have another free medical mission in their town. For the residents, an activity such as this is very important, especially that most of them work as farmers and are poor. More 700 residents received various services in the activity rendered by UNTV and members Church of God International. These include dental extraction, ECG, medical adult and pediatric consultations, as well as legal consultation. Free haircut and free massage were also available for residents who wanted to relax a bit. Hindi po namin ito makakalimutan, lalo-lalo na po sa mga uh, nabiyayaan ng mga proyekto. Sa UNTV po naman ay uh, mas kilala na po namin sila dahil hindi lang po ito ang pagkakataon na sila ito matulong. Mahalaga po at The local government of Rizal, Laguna expressed their gratitude for the assistance the residents received. In behalf of Mayor ng Rizal, Laguna, uh, maraming maraming salamat po kay Brother Eli at saka kay Kuya Daniel dahil uh, napaunlakan sila dito na magkaroon ng medical mission. Maraming maraming pong salamat dahil hindi nila kami binigo. Leslie Lombowen for Servisyong Kasang Bahay. Most parts of the country will experience a fair weather as there is no tropical cyclone seen to affect the country. Pagasa says only the easterly release and the northeast monsoon affect parts of the country. Isolated light rains are expected in Cagayan Valley, Cordillera and Ilocos region. Metro Manila and the rest of Luzon, 
Visayas and Mindanao will have partly cloudy to cloudy skies with isolated rain showers and thunderstorms. Coming up, U.S. President Donald Trump promises a new era of American greatness in his first address to the U.S. Congress. And to know why there are no chairs at a stand-up steakhouse in New York City. More from Y News after this break. The World Health Organization has called on governments to help increase the research and development of new antibiotics. Jovic Barmas will tell us why. The World Health Organization published its first ever list of antibiotic-resistant priority pathogens. WHO published the list on Monday ahead of this week's G20 meeting of health experts to spur governments to put in place policies that incentivize basic science and advanced R&D by both publicly funded agencies and the private sector investing in new antibiotic discovery. The list names 12 families of bacteria that pose the greatest threat to human health, divided into three categories according to the urgency of need for new antibiotics. WHO scientist Nicola Magrini said the discovery and development of new drugs, including antibiotics, usually takes around 10 years or more. He says the list is trying to attract the attention of the G20 on finding new mechanisms to develop new antibiotics. Today we announced the, f the release of the first WHO uh, global pathogen list that is a prioritized list of important bacteria that have shown important uh, resistance or uh, high burden on, on, on mortality rate or hospitalization and it will be very important for uh, government and industry for developing new models to, to actually discover and put into the market new drugs. WHO said while more R&D was vital, it cannot solve the problem alone. The organization said there had to be better prevention of infections and appropriate use of existing antibiotics in humans and animals, as well as rational use of any new antibiotics that are developed in the future to properly address antibiotic resistance. Jovic Burmas, UNTV News and Rescue. New York City plans to open 90 new shelters as city officials struggle to get a handle on homelessness. Clarence Shaughnessy tells us why. New York City officials struggle to get a handle of homelessness, which has climbed to its highest level in almost a century. This is according to the city mayor Bill de Blasio. The move is intended to allow the city to move away from housing people in cluster sites, which have been criticized as expensive and unsafe. I know if we continually do this work, we might find solutions that are even deeper. We might find an even better pathway. But right now, I want to break the cycle. I want to break the pattern of the last three and a half decades of us going in the wrong direction. Some 62,000 people, mostly families, sleep in city shelters each night. The number has doubled over the past 15 years to reach its highest point since the Great Depression of the 1930s, according to the city figures. De Blasio called the plan his administration's blood and guts war strategy at winning the city's long-failed struggles against homelessness. The plan calls for 20 new shelters after the next 10 months, another 20 next year, and 5 per year after that bringing to the total of more than 360 shelters. 30 existing shelters will be expanded. Clarence Shaughnessy, UNTV News and Rescue, New York, USA. U.S. President Donald Trump, during his first speech in Congress as U.S. President, promised a renewal of America's global leadership, telling members of Congress that he wanted to usher in an era of unity and strength in a new chapter in American greatness. A new national pride is sweeping across our nation, and a new surge of optimism is placing impossible dreams firmly within our grasp. What we are witnessing today is the renewal of the American spirit. After a turbulent start to his presidency, Trump went before Congress to give a speech that was closely watched for details of his plans 
for the economy and whether he can strike a more conciliatory tone. World financial markets were to scrutinize the address in the House of Representatives for specifics of how the Republican president aims to make good on promises to tackle tax reform, boost infrastructure spending, and amplify regulations he says are harming business. Scientists believe a new laser technique will give insight into the, into the history of small feathered dinosaurs taking flight as birds. Dulce Alarcon will tell us why. A technique using high-powered laser to reveal hidden soft tissue alongside bones in fossils is giving scientists insights into one of the major evolutionary transitions in the history of life. Small feathered dinosaurs taking flight as birds, a Hong Kong paleontologist revealed on Wednesday. The technique called Laser Stimulated Fluorescence, or LSF, involves sweeping laser light across a specimen, which highlights otherwise invisible details on objects. At a news conference, University of Hong Kong Dr. Michael Pittman said he and his team worked on fossil of a chicken-sized feathered bird-like dinosaur and curious that lived in China about 160 million years ago. What it is, is it has um, skin in front of its elbow called the propatagium. This feature um, is crucial in modern birds that fly because without it, they, they couldn't. Um, so we have this kind of shallow morphology, this shallow shape, which is reminiscent of modern uh, gliding and soaring birds. However, it is unclear whether Ancurnus was airborne. The study, published in the journal Nature Communication, produced the first highly detailed body outline of such a feathered dinosaur, is a landmark in understanding avian origins. At the moment, you know, we, we think that flights evolved just once, uh, and we have other animals that, you know, at least one that was capable of gliding that was bird-like, not a bird. But the experimentation that happened in the late Jurassic, uh, you know, up, leading up to the origin of birds, well, we're still, that's still a hot topic. So research like this is going to uh, help to, you know, push us along in deepening understanding of how this happened. It is believed Ancurnus was covered in feathers resembling those of modern birds and had foot scales like those of a chicken but lacked a bony breastbone or sternum and short tail skeleton found in modern birds. It had small sharp teeth like those of the earliest bird and may have eaten small animals like lizards. Dulce Alarcon, UNTV News and Rescue, Shanghai, China. The 2018 Tour de France is set at a rare road path. Meanwhile, Olympic multi-medalist Michael Phelps speaks before the U.S. Congress. Aaron Romero will tell us why. Michael Phelps, the most decorated Olympian of all time, tells the U.S. Congress that he never felt any competitions outside America was clean. The Olympics multi-medalist testifies in the presence of representatives from WADA and the International Olympic Committee that all athletes must trust the anti-doping system and observe fair play. Throughout my career, I've thought that some athletes were cheating. And in some cases, those suspicions were confirmed. Given all the testing I and so many others have been through, I have a hard time understanding this. I don't believe that I've stood up on international, at an international competition and the rest of the field has been clean. Meanwhile, Tour de France Christian Prudhomme unveils the cycling race's 2018 Grand Depart from the Vendée in the Pays de la Loire region of France. It will be a return to the race's roots as the first edition in 1903 was also hosted by the Western region. This rare road path, which is completely submerged by the sea at high tide, will mark the start of 2018's race. On the other hand, this year's tour begins in the German city of Dusseldorf. Aaron Romero, UNTV News and Rescue, New York. Diners have to eat steak standing up at Ikinari Steak, a Japanese chain that debuted recently in New York. Nino Armilio will tell us why. 
that carnivores who stood in line to get into the steakhouse will keep standing when they get in. There are no chairs at Ikinari Steak, which debuted in New York City last week. Customers eat standing up. That way, Ikinari can sell more steaks and make more money by serving more customers, and it hopes to get them in and out in 30 minutes. There are no appetizers, like creamed spinach, on the one-page menu of this Japanese steakhouse chain. No desserts or coffee either. No incentives to stick around. Customers like Jacob Navok and his wife Chihiro go first to the butcher station, order from one of the three cuts, ribeye, sirloin, and filet, then choose how many ounces they want. The scale tells them this 5-ounce sirloin will cost $19. Right now it's the morning, so I didn't want too big of a cut, so I ordered something a little bit less, and I'm very happy with that. Ellie Keys got a chalkeye steak, salad, soup, and rice. The cost was $20. US dollars. I think it's a really good experience because I can burn calories as I eat, right? So I'm standing up. <laughs> Keep good posture, right? And, uh, you know, and eating some protein, so not too bad. To make money, the restaurant must pull in 200 customers a day. Founder Kunio Ichinose plans to create a stand up culture. Ichinose has ambitious plans, and he intends to open 10 locations in New York this year. He also aims to list his company on the NASDAQ in three years. And that's no bull. Nina Armilio, UNTV News and Rescue, Philippines. Those are the reasons behind the news. March 1, 2017. Evangelo Castro III. Reasons we deliver to you as they unfold. I'm Darlene Basingan. Because we need to know, we will always ask why. Thank you for watching Why News.